Hello and welcome back. And that's right, today we're going to answer a very simple question. Is now the time to jump on board uh, Gen 5 M2 NVMEs right now? Let's face it, this channel, along with a bunch of other YouTube channels out there, have been talking about Gen 5 SSDs a lot. The greatest, the fastest, etc, etc. And all the SSD brands, be they first or third party utilizing existing hardware and partner relationships, are jumping on board right now. And frankly, a lot of users that are on the verge of buying new hardware, new gaming hardware, new editing suite hardware, have got a bit of a choice in terms of future proofing, in terms of what they get their best value for money now, about whether to go for Gen 5 as a whole. Is it too early? Is it actually starting to blossom in a way that it wasn't 12 to 18 months ago? And in today's video, I'm going to give you four reasons why it's not worth going for. I'm going to give you three reasons why it is worth going for, and one middling reason that isn't either or the other. And hopefully by the end of this video you'll have made your decision right now whether you want to jump on gen 5 or stick with gen 4 or gen 3. Now the first good thing I would say about jumping on gen 5 right now and this is going to sound weird so bear with me it's actually surprisingly good value for money gen 5 once you hit motherboards if you're building a pc rig or an editing suite from scratch it is arguable that right now the price point for Gen 5 motherboards has dipped quite significantly. Now, some brands more than others have been playing with that price tag quite a lot, but if we flick over to the screen now, you're able to see here on screen that even a very quick search of Amazon has already revealed a bunch of Gen 5 uh, motherboards here that aren't going to break the bank. We've got one here at 194, we have another one here at 229, we've got another one here at 214, and we've got another one here at another 214, and indeed another one here at 218. And that was a very quick search there. But what you may have noticed is most of those were Asus. Asus, more than anyone else, has really been driving the prices down on their Gen 5 um, PCIe. Uh, motherboards the reason being because a lot of their uh, kit a lot of their components and a lot of their upgrades are geared towards that as well now another thing we're talking about when i mentioned value because i'm not going to say these are cheap because they're not if you look at the cost right now of gen 4 motherboards you're getting gen 4 motherboards around 50 to maybe 60 percent of the price of a gen 5 so why would I say it is good value when you can get a Gen 4 motherboard right now um, for, in some cases, half the price? Well, nice and simple, because Gen 5 architecture motherboards generally arrive with an upgrade on every other component there. The majority of them arrive with Thunderbolt 4 and or USB Type 4 straight off the bat. Many of them arrive with 2.5 gigabit Ethernet LAN straight off the bat, and some of them even include 10 GBE for as little as 100, uh, sorry, 50 to 80 quid more. On top of that, you've got DDR5 support there on board, and USB 3.2 Gen 2 support straight off the bat, and of course, support of the newer generation of CPUs from Intel and uh, AMD. So, Overall, when it comes to specking up your system early doors, if you do go for a Gen 4 board right now, yes, you are going to make a saving, but there are several areas in which you will miss out on other upgraded components. Again, Thunderbolt 4 probably being the one that stands out the most over all of those, but still nonetheless, upgrades on network connectivity, upgrades on general DAS connectivity, and more. Next up, it's worth talking about the choice. Now, when Gen 4 rolled around from most of the SSD brands out there, I think it would be fair to say that the range of SSDs that were available on day one weren't great. Whether it was the SSDs that you could actually buy at the retail level or SSDs that had already been promised at trade shows like CES, the range of Gen 4 SSDs in the market was significantly smaller than what we're seeing right now, both available and promised at the Gen 5 generation. Now, let's be fair to Gen 4. Gen 4 was peaking around the pandemic in 2020. That is when you saw a lot of the big players start to appear. And unfortunately, that certainly had its impact on production. And of course, consumer buying habits may have changed some brands' desires to show off the SSDs they had. But when you saw the first generation of Gen 4 SSDs arriving in around 2018-19, both showed off and eventually rolled out, they were peaking at speeds, uh, sequential read and write, of about five to five and a half thousand. Now, 
It took about a year and a half before we started to see from uh, SSD brands like WD uh, and from uh, Samsung rolling out their 7K Gen 4 SSDs there that were really making the most of a potential 8,000 megs to play with there on the bandwidth, which will then follow very, very quickly by brands like Sir Brent and Seagate around three to six months later. Now, we fast forward to now at the Gen 5 generation. I think it would be fair to say the Gen 5 SSDs were making the most noise mid to early 2022. And right now, one year to a year and a half after that, flick over to the screen, the sheer range of SSDs that are being shown around the place is extraordinary. This list of SSDs are SSDs that we saw during Computex over in Taipei uh, less than a month ago now, and some of them being DRAMless, some of them arriving with performance numbers that were just incredible, peaking at around 14 gigabits, uh, gigabytes per second, gigabytes, not gigabits. Then you've got SSDs that are being reviewed right now. You've got the Corsair, you've got the Crucial, you've got Gigabyte SSD, and they're even working onto their second phase right now. More on that later on. The Seagate 540 was launched early this week at the time of recording and has already seen review. There are loads and loads and loads and loads of Gen 5 SSDs being revealed and are available right now. So at the moment when it comes to picking a Gen 5 SSD or going for a Gen 5 host system for your storage and just overall, it's worth highlighting that right now the sheer range of storage potential for you is exceedingly larger than what you saw at the Gen 4 and even Gen 3 generation when that rolled around. Next up, it's worth talking about expansion cards because with Gen 5 and the tremendous bandwidth improvements it brings over Gen 4, it does open the door to much more highly specced and desirable expansion cards like this one. Now, what is an expansion card? Well, in most cases it comes under different forms, but at least in the context of storage, it allows you in this case to take advantage of one Gen 5 x 16 slot that may be available on any number of those motherboards I showed you earlier that, you know, we saw some uh, motherboards there for as little as $199 and allows you to add multiple M2 NVMEs. This is one from our test machine over there. Now, because each of these SSD lanes here are going to be Gen 5 times 4 each and it's on a Gen 5 times 16 slot, that still affords plenty of bandwidth for those SSDs to really stretch their muscles, at least as far as sequential performance, something we'll talk about later on. Now, the growing market for Gen 5 cards has increased. If we look here on screen, we've got the AS Rock one here, and although cooling is always going to be a factor, as you can see from those fans and the one here, it's worth highlighting that these cards in some cases allowed you to have up to four M2 NVMEs of Gen 5 SSD storage, or in some case, a combination of Gen 5 on one side and Gen 4 on the other, all sharing that tremendous Gen 5 x 16 bandwidth. Now, you might be, you might want to say, well, you've got that for Gen 4. You could do the same with Gen 4. And you're right. There are Gen 4 expansion cards like this that give you two, four, and even more available slots. Now, all of this comes down to the lanes. That is, the CPU and the motherboard and their own lanes built within the processor and what it can handle in the chipset of the motherboard, ultimately allowing you to do as many things as possible. And allocating different devices of hardware onto your configuration takes up lanes. Now, at the Gen 5 generation, the amount of data per lane increases substantially. Uh, from at Gen 4, 2,000 or 2 gigabytes per lane up to 4 gigabytes per lane. So the result is that a card like this can occupy more M2 slots, each of which can really take advantage of the performance benefits and the multiplication on each of those available lanes within the CPU chipset. If you do go for a Gen 4 system, yes, you could put multiple of those SSDs in, but each of those lanes will only give you the Gen 4 or Gen 5 limitations accordingly. So therefore, going for a Gen 5 system, in terms of that future proofing that we talked about earlier on, allows you to go for upgraded cards like these and make the most of it on a far more resource uh, efficient way for bandwidth. And it's also worth touching on that a lot of motherboards are starting to roll out with these upgrade cards included with them. The reason being that there are some motherboards that don't have an M2 NVMe PCI Gen 5 slot on them. They've only got one times 16 slots, some of them more cost effective, some of them not, like this one, uh, just under $600 there. And that includes a card with it, but there's a lot of users 
that simply don't need it. And it's very easy, and I mean really easy, to find users online that are selling these cards pretty cheap. I found some between 100 and 200 Nika, quite a few of them around 150, and that will allow you to add that card for later. So Gen 5 has always had this reputation, at least at launch, and it is true in some cases, more on that later, that the sheer cost is very off-putting for early adopters, but there are ways and means to make a better value decision and indeed make savings in other ways. But that's enough talking about the reasons to jump on Gen 5. There's actually quite a few reasons, unsurprisingly, why it's worth sitting on the fence just a little bit longer. Now, the first reason you might want to sit on the fence just a little bit longer is something that I alluded to earlier on, and that is to do with when this technology first arrives and then how it evolves and, you know, how this technology stretches its muscles. And in the case of Gen 5, it has to be said that the earliest adopters and indeed those that rolled out their SSDs before everyone else are now not even eight months later looking a little slow classic example would be gigabyte aurorus um with their 10,000 ssd that rolled out the gate with 10,000 um megabytes per second sequential read and 9.5 um, um oh, 9,500 megabytes per second sequential writes there now not very much time went by flick back to the screen when we noticed that there were just so so many ssds starting to roll out the gate with higher performance than that. We saw a lot of these 10G SSDs rolling out, as you can see here on screen, but it wasn't that long before we started seeing SSDs like this start to be talked about. They can hit 14 gigabytes per second on that sequential read and 10 to 12 gigabytes per second sequential write. And in much of the way that we saw the Gen 4 generation roll out the gate, with SSDs um, not very long after, eight months after the early adopters started rolling out, uh, they started going with 7K SSDs, it made a lot of the first generation of Gen 4 SSDs look quite slow, and they couldn't really change the pricing too much. So you ended up getting SSDs that were substantially higher in performance for just small amounts of money more, and just a little bit of waiting there. And the same is happening now with the Gen 5 generation. The earliest adopters jumped out of the gate showing off. Let's go for it there with the Gigabyte rolling out the gate with 10,000 megabytes per second SSDs. And now they, when they rolled their SSDs out and not many people were buying it, are now looking slow when adoption is starting to increase. And there are these 14 to uh, 12 gig sequential read-write drives. And again, brands like or uh, Aurorus or Aurus have now got to roll out their second gen of Gen 5, which has got to be costly in terms of R&D. And it makes you wonder how many of the first wave of these drives, the first iteration, were actually sold at that inflated price. Yes, availability was low, but still, that price was pretty darn high. Another point I think needs to be made very, very clear about Gen 5 adoption is that although we're hearing lots of lovely, lovely numbers about all of these performance read and write, bear in mind those are sequential reads. That's when the data is all big and blocky and next to each other there. Now, in the real world scenarios, in non-synthetic testing, you're going to have a lot of difficulty hitting those numbers unless your system is seriously pimped out. And then when we look at IOPS numbers there, 4K random IOPS, which is effectively the smallest amount of data being accessed in random locations as quickly as possible, even those tests in themselves have an element of um, artificiality to them. And in real world scenarios, when you're opening apps, opening games, opening task booting computers, you know, it's not going to be those highs. And right now, the differences between Gen 4 and Gen 5 in those real world setup and scenarios, in non sequential tests and non uh, artificial sequential testing, is a lot smaller in margin uh, between Gen 4 and Gen 5 than a lot of SSD brands would want you to think. And on top of that, until the surrounding hardware can better leverage the performance of these SSDs and what they're capable of, I think this is going to continue to be the case for a while yet. And it's just another clear reason why adopting Gen 5 right now might not be best for you.
Next up, I talked about value earlier and future improvement, but let's be realistic. For a number of us, it's going to be about the old Wonga, isn't it? And if we make our way over to the screen, there's no denying right now that Gen 5 is still exorbitantly expensive. It has a rarity value to it, and certainly the return on investment for a lot of the R&D by these brands needs to be paid as far as they're concerned. So case in point, we've got three 2TB drives here, and the price point for these Gen 5 2TBs is about the three to 330 Nicker mark. We've got the Crucial here, one of the earliest ones. Now looking at these three Gen 5 SSDs here, the price point again is around three to three hundred and thirty dollars there for two terabytes of storage. That's quite a lot, you know. And that's the T700 here at 2TB, no heat sink included for that price for 339. Then you've got the Spatium M570, and again, these are pretty much all 10 gig drives, and again, $329 there. And then you've got slightly out there ones by, I'm not going to say lesser known brands, but I am going to say less mainstream outside of core gamer groups. The SSTC Tiger Shark here, again, that's 299 for the 2TB. Now, to put that into perspective on the Gen 4 generation, remember, because these are SSDs that are all promoting um, up to 10,000 uh, megabytes per second or 10 gig sequential performance there for read. We can look at the Sabrent, again, one of the earliest Gen 4 SSDs out there that's recently seen an upgrade in its NAND layer quality there. And again, a 2TB is a half that price. It's 149 for that 2TB, which means then you can start looking at four terabytes. Then you can start looking at eight terabytes there. Yes, it's expensive, but the price per terabyte price point there is exponentially lower. The same thing goes when we look at A-Data here, 2TB, $129 there. WD Black's later release of the uh, uh, SN850, the SN850X version there. The 2TB is available there. And if you look at uh, the buying options there, the price point is still pretty darn good for that 2TB and their newest drive. Seagate's Fire Cuda, the most durable Gen 4 drive in the market right now, 174 for the 2TB. And again, that is 0.7 drive rights per day durability. Enormously important, I think, durability for a lot of those intense high recycle rate servers. Um, and then, of course, going returning to the subject of Sabrent there, you've got SSDs there which are now leveraging this whole idea of Microsoft's improved uh, direct storage API that allows um, the system to better leverage that performance that uh, Gen 4 and hopefully Gen 5 into the future can bring and ease off a lot of the load in gaming um, away from the CPU and GPU as the increased importance of storage speed grows to a lot of people's attention. And again, knocking around for $199, you're getting a particularly fast and capable SSD there for substantially less than 2TB of Gen 5, with these drives cranking out over 7,000 megs. The difference is very small between them. This last neg, I will say, for me, Although it's true of every previous generation of M2 NVMEs, I think in the Gen 5 generation, it's more important than ever. And that is, when you're seeing these advertised speeds of these SSDs, again, whether it is 10 gig, 12 gig, 14 gig, the brands, when they release multiple capacities, always use the largest capacity for that performance measurement. And that's because the largest capacity has the most NAND modules on board to be accessed at any given time. And much like drives, I hate seagulls, in a RAID environment where multiple drives are being read and written to and therefore open up the doorway to higher performance, the larger capacity is having more NAND cells to access at any given time my god, the seagulls are going nuts today, results in higher performance bandwidth. However, it's not until you dig into the specifications of these drives that you start to find, looking at them, that the lower capacities, and that indeed the more affordable capacities, have that lower performance number. Look at this. This is an SSD, the Aurora uh, Gen 5 10,000, named after its 10 gig performance, and if you go to the 1TB, even they don't rate it at 10 gig there. The 2TB does, but the 1TB doesn't. And the same is applicable when you look at other SSDs like the T700 here, with the 4TB drive there giving fantastic performance measurements there. With uh, read and write at 12 and a half almost over 11,800. 11, but the minute you flick down to the lowest available capacity, which again, remember, is still going to be pretty expensive, uh, around between 180 to 200 nicker, 
that performance number does dip. And look at that sequential right going under that 10,000 mark. And again, it's completely true of even the most recent SSD releases like the Seagate Fire Cuda, which again, once we zoom in, you see that the 1TB model is 9.5 uh, and, uh, and 8.5, whereas it is that large capacity. So again, even though this is extensively true on multiple generations of SSD, it was true at Gen 4 and Gen 3, the thing is, the margin of difference when you get to the more expensive capacities in Gen 5, it means that this dip actually costs you quite a lot of real world money if you believe these performance numbers. I think it would be better if at the very least they went for the lowest possible performance benchmark there because they are based on synthetic numbers anyway. But overall, this could just be another reason why if you were going to opt for a 1TB drive for your Gen 5 upgrade, that you're not going to be getting synthetic or otherwise the performance numbers that you think you might. Which leads us to what I think I would call the ambivalent point in the middle here at the end. Neither good nor bad nor a reason to go for Gen 5 or not, but just something to be aware of. And that is that right now, Gen 5 and its use within gaming, within content creation, within AI is being explored. We mentioned earlier on about Microsoft's um, leveraging of the performance of NVMe at the Gen 4 level being greater harness towards gaming there. And now we're seeing things like the Unreal Engine uh, version 5 coming out and more games being developed on that. You're seeing more and more systems, and particularly PC gaming systems, that will allow the higher performance values of Gen 5 to be realized. But we're not there yet. Indeed, if the PS5 Pro ever arrives on the scene in the next year or two, as leaks seem to indicate, that is almost certainly going to be a Gen 5 system. And when that happens, the PS5 development and the developers of games, both on multi-platform level and PS5 only, and the same goes for Xbox as well, will almost certainly a new and improved Pro version of that, you're going to see that better leveraging there overall of that technology and NVMe Gen 5 performance bandwidth being realized. We're not there now, but we're going to be soon. And therefore, the reason it lives between a reason to go for it and a reason not to is because of that whole future-proofing thing. If you're buying something now and you're hoping to get three to five years out of it, there's every possibility that in three years, we as an industry will be in a much better place to take advantage of it. I really hate seagulls today. And ultimately, that could be the main change for you, whether you go for Gen 5 right now or not. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you found this video helpful. I'm going to go on the roof with a shotgun. And if you have enjoyed this, there are links to other articles and videos that we've done previously on the subject of Gen 5. So do check those out. But apart from that, thank you so much for watching. Visit those links. Use the free advice section, the Discord, and the free Ask NASCAR Pairs Community Forum. And I'll see you next time.